this is a subject which is very close to my heart. Not close to my heart because I'm a female uh, chief executive who is, has a particular bias towards uh, female founders, but a subject close to my heart because I really believe that Ireland isn't uh, maximising the value of female entrepreneurs. And therefore, if we want, and certainly from a government policy perspective, uh, there's a very clear mandate to organisations like Enterprise Ireland to drive jobs, to drive entrepreneurship, and we can't do it without having an increase from female entrepreneurs as well as male entrepreneurs. And the figures that Anne gave in terms of 37% of the figures that came from the World Bank saying which are female entrepreneurs. And it's interesting just to look, and granted Enterprise Ireland is dealing with a subset of projects in that on an annual basis we would support 100 high potential startups. And for quite a number of years we had a steady percent of female entrepreneurs versus ma male entrepreneurs. So if you say roughly a team that we're supporting has two or three people in it, and if we support 100 high potential startups a year, then that's 250 promoters coming in that we are supporting in those 100 projects. Up until 2012, on a good year, uh, we had uh, seven female entrepreneurs supported. So that was seven female entrepreneurs with females as part of the, of the decision. So when the two Johns both said that females aren't coming in the door, there was a large part of it because I can assure you that we weren't turning down 10 times as many females as we, we were turning down males. So there is something about getting more females in the door. So if, if we look then at, and I'm just dealing with that subset start in terms of the high potential startups that we're looking at. And high potential uh, is the capacity to create um, 10 jobs or, and a million turnover within three years. So it's, it's not a massively ambitious figure, but that's the, that's the bar above which it's considered a high potential startup. So only seven projects in a year out of the hundred, seven females in a year as part of the teams. So a pretty low performance overall. Uh, it has been, the, the spotlight of government policy has been on it for the last few years. There's an action plan for jobs, which is effectively the Bible in the agencies in terms of quarterly reporting on what we're doing against all of the, 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 the actions which are given to us from the department, the minister, the Taoiseach on an, on an annual basis. That figure, uh, and we have in the last couple of years introduced a competitive start pro uh, program as well. So the number of, of uh, if we go to 2012, which would have been a pretty average, the total number of females between competitive starts and HPSUs, and competitive starts is where we put 50,000 in towards a first really very early, uh, almost like a large feasibility to move projects along. Uh, we supported 15, uh, there were 15 females supported in total, so seven high potential startups and 15 in the total amount. And that's out of 180 projects overall, approximately, there were 15 females. It has been the spotlight of, of, of policy, a lot of work done. Role models is one of the issues that has come up time and time again here today. And certainly we've been doing a lot and I certainly am happy to stand in any, any stage and promote female entrepreneurship because it's something which has to increase. Uh, but even by, sp uh, I mean, I was interested when I came in first today and Gráinne said, the more there are, the more there will be. And that's absolutely true just simply based on role models and all of the evidence uh, and research has shown that females are more impacted by role models than males. So if we actually can increase the number of role models, it will have an exponential effect overall. So it's something which, you know, it will get better once you have the role models. It won't get better by making the wrong decisions in terms of supporting projects, which is why you know, they have to stand up to commercial scrutiny. But I think there's a lot in the females not coming in the EI door. Now, we did a lot of work as to why they weren't coming in the door. Some of it was down to the literature that we had, which was not as uh, holistic as it might be. So we did quite a bit of work in terms of trying to be broader in terms of the way things were written so that they didn't sound as they were written just for a male audience. 
Some of it is, I mean, if you look at the, the projects that we support annually, if you take the 100, about 73% of those uh, promoters come from senior and middle management in existing companies, be it multinational or existing Irish companies. And do the maths, anybody looking at the, the number of females in middle and senior management in existing companies, it's a much lower percent of figures. So it's not to be unexpected that it will take time for those numbers to increase in order to increase the feedstock, which is why I hope John is absolutely wrong in his 40-year horizon, but he may not be, because actually the figures aren't increasing as much as you would have hoped. So it is the feedstock that is not typically based on where that high potential grouping will come. Now that can all sound really depressing, but I actually am very optimistic because when the spotlight was put on it, in 2013, the figure of 15 went to 41. The number of high potential startups went from seven to 16. And it was not that we give an easier uh, ride to female entrepreneurs coming in. They were judged you know, by the, the, the private sector investment committee panel using exactly the same criteria. So there is something about needing, and there has been a lot of focus from a role modeling perspective. There has been a much more open approach from Enterprise Ireland. Gina Sullivan has been here. Gina has done massive work in my book and is to be commended for working in every hole in the hedge in Ireland to reach out to female entrepreneurs and actually encourage them to come forward and championing them in terms of number one working to tell them why they have no chance of getting support and what they need to do in order to be able to, to, to be more attractive to investors. Actually an interesting uh, piece. A, a lot of the, the uh, issues that Anne raised would follow from the, the research that we did in terms of looking at the female entrepreneurs, and these are ones that we had already supported, but the lack of role models, the access to finance issues, the self-confidence, the lack of networking, the lack of technical expertise, these were the things which we were getting back from all of the research that we did internally. Actually, one of the things which hasn't been mentioned, I'm not saying it wasn't mentioned earlier today, but certainly from my personal, and this is a Julie Cinnamon personal experience, so please do not take it as any other, anything other than that. The ambition level of females coming in, in my experience, in dealing with males and females in Enterprise Ireland, has, they, they have been different. Right? So the first year when we introduced a competitive feasibility fund, and because this was something new, I sat through all of the you know, the applicants coming in to present their cases, all females, set amount, you know, a, a, an amount of money available. And I stand corrected if there was one, but I don't think there was one female who looked for the, the amount of money which had been written down that you could get. Now, in all of my time sitting on panels, I don't think I've ever seen one man who didn't, right? So there is something in terms of, and uh, I, I know Anne says that the fear of failure, there isn't such a big difference. Personally, and again, it's my own perception I'm giving you here as opposed to anything else. I actually don't know that women deal with failure as well as men deal, deal with failure. And therefore, women will set out an ambition level which they are confident that they will achieve very often and they will overachieve it. A man will set out a higher ambition level and they may underachieve it and they may both end up in the middle, but there's something about that ambition level. It certainly isn't unique to women. It was the biggest constraint when we started the Leadership for Growth program with the software sector many years ago. And it was really the biggest mindset change in working on the ambition level of the CEOs who were all male at that stage in terms of the, the early cohorts that went on that program. But once the ambition level was raised and the skills, etc., were added, the, the, the growth accelerated. So personally, I think the ambition level it's linked to the confidence, but there is definitely, uh, I think Anne used the words, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And there's a little bit of a different approach in terms of the applications which come in, uh, in my experience, from men and women coming into the system. So there's certainly not enough people walking in the door. And that's why the people in this room who are female founders have a really massive bonus, not just to do it yourselves, but the impact that you're going to have 
in Ireland going forward in terms of setting out role models for other generations to follow, I think is really important. So it isn't just about doing it for yourselves, you're doing it for future generations. Uh, the diversity in founding teams is something which is uh, a plus, and all of the research shows, and it is not just diversity, male, female, but that is, that's a good thing. Why are we doing it? We're not doing it for any other reason than Ireland needs more successes. And I think that point was made uh, earlier in this panel. And therefore, by having more female entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs we are more likely to have more successes. Um, in terms of uh, the ambition of talking about kids, uh, the, the, certainly having gone from 7 to 15 and from uh, you know, 16 to 41, it's very clear that if role models are constantly put out and if, uh, if the raw material in, in terms of females are encouraged, there is a lot of ambition and a lot of opportunity in my book. And I believe that uh, this is something which will grow, you know, and certainly the pressure is now on Jean to go from 41 last year to, God, Jean, what percent increase was that last year? So there's, uh, we, we'll hit the figures this year, no doubt. But it is about keeping, keeping the spotlight on it. Um, I mean, all the figures show that Ireland sort of punches above its weight in terms of in the, generally in entrepreneurship. I think one of the big challenges is about scaling those projects. And that's a challenge for females as well as for males. And that's something which there's probably been a lot of debate on uh, female entrepreneurship, we actually need to have as much debate on scaling the, the projects that we have, be it male or female, in order to maximise the potential as well as bringing in loads of new uh, promoters. So from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, this is a really high priority because we need more jobs and two thirds of new jobs are created by companies within the first five years. So it's really good from that perspective. But actually, Ireland, we are an entrepreneurial people, and I think we can do a lot more. So just to conclude and to let you get upstairs, thanks to Anne and the team. It's a really good discussion. There's a lot of important issues here. It's early days, and certainly from an Enterprise Ireland perspective, if anybody has any views as to what we can do better in order to help female entrepreneurs, I'd love to hear them. So thank you very much, and good luck to everybody.